so we have to simplify this, give it in the form p plus q root 3, and uh, this is what we call rationalizing the denominator. And the trick here is we want to change the way this fraction looks, but without changing its value, and we can do that by multiplying it by a 1. Um, and in this case, the 1 that we want to multiply by is root 3 plus 1 over root 3 plus 1. We know that because the denominator um, from our original fraction here is root 3 minus 1. And whenever you have something like that in the denominator, what you need to do is multiply by the same expression but with the minus sign replaced by a plus sign. And if it had been a plus sign initially, you would do multiply it by the same thing with the minus sign. And the reason is because difference of two squares means that the thirds uh, will disappear. Okay, and we'll see how that works. So in the numerator, um, I'll write it out in full. We've got 5 minus 2 root 3 times root 3 minus 1. The denominator, if you're confident with the difference of two squares, you can skip this step. I'm going to put it in root 3 minus 1 root 3 plus 1. I hope you spot the deliberate mistake in the numerator. That should be a plus. I beg your pardon. Um, and then we just have to expand the brackets. The numerator, okay, we've got to do 5 times root 3. So that's 5 root 3. 5 times the 1. So that's simply 5. And then it's, this is minus 2 root 3. So we have to do minus 2 root 3 times root 3. So minus 2, and root 3 times root 3 is just uh, 3. So I'll put that as, for the moment, I'll put it as root 3 squared. And then finally, minus 2 root 3 times 1, so that's a bit messy, is minus 2 root 3. In the denominator, okay, this is the step that, um, another step basically you can miss out if you're confident. Um, but this shows how it works. We do root 3 times root 3, which is 3. Root 3 times 1, so plus root 3. Uh, minus 1 times root 3, so that's minus root 3. And minus 1 times 1, which is minus 1. So these two terms are going to disappear. That one and that one, they cancel each other out. So what are we left with? Well, in the numerator, we have 5 root 3 from here. Take away 2 root 3. So that's simply 3 root 3. And then we have 5 minus this term here, which is 2 times 3. So 5 minus 6. So that's minus 1. And the denominator, we simply have 3 take away 1, which is 2. Um, so it's not quite in the form that's required, it should be in the form p plus q root 3, so uh, we can separate out into two fractions, 3 over 2 root 3 minus a half. Okay, and if you want to be really pernickety and write it in the order that they wanted it, it's minus a half plus 3 over 2. Okay, so we have this expression, root 75 minus root 27, and we want to put it in the form k root x, where k and x are integers. So basically, something roots something, uh, with all whole numbers. And any question like this, really, you just need to look at the thirds that you've got and simplify them, write them in their very simplest form, and then usually um, the answer sort of jumps out at you from there. So if we try that, root 75, do it in stages. Um, 75, you need to look for the factors of 75 and ideally find one that's a square number. Um, so you could have 15 and 5, but neither of those is a square number. But 25 and 3 is perfect because 25 is a square number. So I'll rewrite 75 as 25 times 3. And then for root 27, do a similar thing and I'm going to use 3 times 9. Um, and in this case, I can then split up each one into um, the product of two thirds. So in this case, root 
in this case root 25 times root 3 and here we've got root 3 times root 9 and well from here we're almost there root 25 is just 5 so this term this whole first term becomes 5 root 3 the second term is root 3 times root 9 and root 9 is 3 so this term is simply 3 root 3 and here it just becomes like uh, collecting like terms in algebra they're both terms in root 3 so we can subtract 5 root 3 take away 3 root 3 is 2 root 3 nice and quick right a nice little indices question here part A uh, we have to work out the value of 16 to the power minus a quarter um, so two things to deal with here we've got the fact that we've got a fraction a quarter and we've got a minus sign okay we don't make, want to make sure we don't get these confused the minus sign we can take to mean the reciprocal okay so if it's a fraction you can flip it upside down if it's an integer as we've got 16 here um, we replace it, that with 1 over 16 so you can either write 1 over 16 to the power a quarter or you can write 1 over 16 to the power a quarter. Now either of these is fine because 1 to the power a quarter is just 1. Okay, um, So it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to go from here. But just be careful at this point when you're dealing with the minus sign and thinking well that means I flip it upside down that doesn't mean that your power gets flipped. The power doesn't go from being a quarter to being 4 over 1. That's not right. Um, so just be careful with that. Um, so anyway, moving on, 1 over 16 to the power of a quarter, that's equal to 1 over the fourth root of 16. Okay, because remember, if you have a fraction as your power, the denominator of the fraction is the root. Um, so the fourth root, uh, without a calculator, it's not something that you can often do, <clears throat> but with a number like 16, you just have to think what uh, times table is it in, what to the power 4 would give me 16. Um, and there aren't many options to try. Um, 3 isn't going to work, 1 isn't going to work. You're left with 2, really. All the other numbers are too big. And if you think about 2 to the power 4, that would be 2 times 2, which is 4, times 2, which is 8, times 2, which is 16. So 2 to the power 4 is 16. So the fourth root of 16 is simply 2. So the answer to part A is 1 over 2, or a half. Right now for part B, um, we have this expression and we're asked to simplify. So we're going to have to apply the power 4 to everything in the bracket. And remember to apply to each part. So we have to do 2 to the power 4 and then x to the power minus a quarter, all of that to the power 4. And once we've done that, we can multiply the whole lot by x. So keeping the x out to the front at the moment, we're going to have 2 to the power 4 and multiply that by x to the power minus a quarter to the power 4. Apply that power to both of those. So that's going to be, well 2 to the power 4 is 16, we just saw that. And x to the power minus a quarter times uh, all to the power 4. When you have a power raised to another power, you simply multiply the powers together. Okay, so minus a quarter is your first power times 4 that's just minus 1. So that's going to be my new power here. So that's x to the power minus 1. Um, so then if I multiply that out, um, take care here, we're not multiplying the x by the 16 and then the x by the x to the minus 1 because the 16 and the x to the minus 1, they're not added to each other, they're multiplied. Okay, so this expression would work equally well without the brackets in it. In fact, I'll write it out like that first. x well, I'll write x times 16x to the minus 1, just to avoid that difficulty. And x times x to the minus 1, two ways to look at this. x times 1 over x, well, that's equal to 1. Or you could say, well, x times x to the minus 1, that's the power 1, really. So if you add the powers, you get x to the power naught, which, again, is 1. In any case, it, 16 times 1, which is... Just 16. Right, 
uh, simultaneous equations featuring a quadratic element. We've got y squared and x squared appearing in this equation. That tells me straight away that I can't use uh, my favorite method from GCSE, which is, to, which is to add the equations or subtract them to try and eliminate x or y. We have to use uh, substitution. Okay, so if you just no number these equations 1 and 2, um, we need to think what can we use to substitute 1 into the other, and you just substitute into your quadratic equation. So the easiest thing is to rearrange equation 1 um, by adding 3x and subtracting 2 from both sides to get y equals 3x minus 2. As soon as we have y equals, it means we can then substitute into the other equation. That means wherever I see y in here, I'm going to replace that with 3x minus 2. So instead of having y squared, I have 3x minus 2 squared. Don't forget the brackets or it'll go completely wrong. And then we simply write out the rest, minus x minus 6x squared equals 0. I have to expand these brackets. So I like to just always remember that the four terms that we've got. So we'll have 3x times 3x. That's 9x squared. We'll have minus 2 times 3x. So that's minus 6x. And we'll have another one of those. So minus 6x. And finally, the minus 2 squared is plus 4. Okay, so that is simply reproducing this. So we still need minus x and minus 6x squared equals 0. So it's a quadratic now. So it's going to give us two solutions for x, and then we'll find the solutions for y by going back to this equation up here. So tidying this up, 9x squared take away 6x squared is 3x squared. We've got a minus 6x and minus 6x, that's minus 12x. With another one here, that's minus 13x. And the only uh, numerical term we've got here is plus 4. Okay, so we look to see if we can factorize this. And if you've done quadratics with me, you may recognize this method, or it may be different. Uh, if you've got a way that works for you, that's absolutely fine. But my way is to write down the value of a multiplied by c. So ac is 3 times 4, that's 12. And then the value of b minus 13. And we want to find two numbers which will multiply to give uh, ac. So multiply to give 12 and add to give minus 13. Um, and after a bit of thought, that gives me minus 1 and minus 12. And so going back to the equation now, uh, we simply replace the minus 13x with minus 12x and minus 1x, or just minus x. Okay, so using these two numbers as my coefficients of x, and then I've got plus 4. And then I simply factorize these adjacent pairs. So the first one here, I can take out 3x from both of them. 3x goes into x minus 4. And we know that the second bracket wants to be the same as the first bracket. So I just need to think what needs to go here. And it would have to be minus or minus 1 effectively. But we don't need to write the 1. And so to complete factorizing, the 3x minus 1 gives me one of my brackets, and the x minus 4 is my other. So that's factorized. Um, this way may be longer than the method that you're used to, but it always works, so it's a good fallback to have. And from this, I can get my two solutions from the first bracket. If that bracket was 0, 3x would equal 1, and therefore x would equal 1 third. And from this bracket here, if that was 0, x would equal 4. OK, so we're most of the way towards my solution. Just need to work out the accompanying y values. So if I call this equation up here equation 3, I can say sub in 3. Oops, a bit messy. Um, so for example, when x equals 1 third, y will equal, well, I'm using, remember, 3x minus 2. So 3 lots of 1 third take away 2. Well, 3, th 3 lots of 1 third is 1. So 1 minus 2 equals minus 1. 
And similarly, when x equals 4, y will equal 3 lots of 4 take away 2. So 12 take away 2, which is 10. And finally, we just present our solutions in pairs. OK, so when x is 1 third, y equals minus 1. Or when x equals 4, y equals 10. Strictly speaking, for the exam, you don't need to pair them up, but it's more correct to do so. OK. All right, so we've got uh, the graph of um, a curve C. And the equation we're told is y equals f of x. And that's all the detail we have. And we know that it has um, a minimum point here at 3 minus 1. And we can see, and we're informed as well, where it crosses the x-axis. So we need to do these various transformations. So first of all, part A, f of 2x. Well, we know that when we multiply by something, that's going to be a stretch. And if we're multiplying inside the brackets here, so replacing x, wherever we see it, replacing that with 2x, that means it's a stretch parallel to the x-axis, scale factor of a half. Um, now, note there's no um, scales on these axes here. Um, and so what I can do when it's a stretch, I can simply draw um, the curve that I've been given uh, exactly the same, but I'm going to have a different scale on there. OK, so that's my best effort at drawing that there. should go through the origin. Um, and we're simply going to show that rather than passing through at um, 6, 0, it's going to pass through at 3, 0. That's still the origin. And the minimum point here, rather than being 3 minus 1, is going to be 1 and a half minus 1, or 3 over 2 minus 1. OK, so the scale factor here was a half because it's the reciprocal of the number in front of x there. All right, part b, y equals minus f of x. If you think about what's happening there, all your y values are changing sign. So rather than being f of x, they become minus f of x. So positive ones become negative, negative become positive. And that simply means that it's a reflection in the x-axis. So we can just try to draw exactly the same curve that we're given, but upside down. Hopefully you can do a slightly better job than that. And then it should be easy to mark on these points here. That crosses at 6, the maximum point there. Instead of being 3 minus 1, it's going to be 3, 1. And that's that. Part C is worth the most, most marks in this question. Um, and we have this little plus p here. So we know that when we add something with a transformation, that's going to be a translation. The whole graph is going to move up, down, left, or right. And if the thing that we're adding is inside the brackets, that means it's a translation parallel to the x-axis. And to know which direction it goes, we effectively take the opposite sign to the one that appears here. So if we're adding something positive, then we're going to actually move in the negative x direction. We're going to move to the left. So um, in this case, we're going to move to the left by p. Now we just have to pay attention to this here. This shows me, first of all, the left-hand side of it shows me that p is greater than 0. So I am adding here a positive value, so it is going to move to the left. But this part of it here shows me that p is less than 3. So it's not going to move to the left by as much as 3. OK, and that's important because if we look at our original graph, it shows that this minimum point here is not going to reach the y-axis when it moves to the left. OK, so that means we can start drawing it knowing that it's going to be the same shape, um, but the minimum point is going to be somewhere in this bottom right quadrant. Um, so I'll draw it. Oh dear, not very smooth. Try and make it a little bit smoother than that. Um, and we know that the minimum point here, it was 3 minus 1, but it's moved, moved to the left by p. So the x-coordinate has been reduced by p. So the x-coordinate is going to be 3 minus p. And the y-coordinate is still minus 1. This bit here, 
the x coordinate there was 0 for that point, so that's going to be just 0 minus p. In other words, minus p. And this one here, it was 6, so it's going to be 6 minus p. And we're done. Right, so we're presented with a quadratic equation here um, where some of the coefficients include this constant k. So the coefficient of x is k minus 3 and the final coefficient is 3 minus 2k. So in the normal kind of language of quadratics, your a is 1, your b is k minus 3 and your c is 3 minus 2k. And whenever you're asked to show an inequality, a bit like this one, um, and you're given a quadratic, then it's going to be something to do with the discriminant. And the final clue here is that we're told that there are two distinct real roots. Okay, That means that when you use the formula to solve the quadratic, it must actually give you two different answers. So the plus minus part of the formula must work. Therefore, b squared minus 4ac, the discriminant has to be positive so that you can square root it. So we're using b squared minus 4ac is greater than 0. So in this case, b is k minus 3. So k minus 3 squared minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is 3 minus 2k. So all of that must be greater than 0. And the right-hand side already looks like what we want. We want greater than 0. So we just need to change the left-hand side, see if we can rearrange that to make it look like what we're asked to prove. So we have to expand our brackets first. k minus 3 squared, we're going to have k squared, uh, two lots of minus 3k, so that's minus 6k, and minus 3 squared, which is plus 9, and then minus, well, it's 4 times 3, so that's minus, that's 12, and 4 times the minus 2k is minus 8k. You have to take extra care with minus signs here. Um, and then when we subtract all of that, k squared minus 6k plus 9. I'm just going to get rid of the brackets first, so we'll end up with minus 12. And the minus and the minus cancel out to give us plus 8k. Is that going to look like what we've got up there? Well, the k squared is there. That's good. If we look at the minus 6k and the 8k, that gives me plus 2k, which is what I wanted. And plus 9, take away 12, gives me minus 3. So that is what was required. Now for part B, we're asked to find the set of possible values of k. That basically means to solve this inequality. And this one's going to factorise fairly easily. Two numbers which multiply to give minus 3 and add to give 2. Um, I'm thinking 3 and minus 1. So k plus 3 times k minus 1 is greater than 0. You can check that in your head by multiplying it out. And um, at this point, we use once it's factorised, we use these two brackets to give us our critical values. OK, so those critical values are k equals minus 3 from the first bracket, and from the second bracket, k equals 1. So finally, we have to consider what range of values k can take. If we look at um, the nature of this quadratic expression, and imagine plotting that, um, the positive coefficient of k squared means it'd be this way up. and if the critical values are minus 3 and 1, we can imagine it crossing uh, an x-axis at minus 3 and 1. So the region for which that expression is greater than 0, well, it's everything to the right of there because it's above the axis and everything to the left of there. So our solution is going to be x, sorry, not x, k is less than minus 3 or k is greater than 1. And there you have it. 
OK, here we go. Part A, we need to find the equation of a line. And it's the line joining these two points for which we're given the coordinates. Um, like any line uh, in coordinate geometry, if you want to know the equation, you need to know two things, the gradient and one point on the line. OK, so we've got a choice of points on the line to use, but first we need to work out the gradient. Um, so we need to divide the difference in the y coordinates by the difference in the x coordinates. Um, so if we call it m, uh, I use the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So in this case, um, I'm taking point 2 to be b and point 1 to be a. So y2 is 0 and y1 is 4. So 2 minus 4 divided by x2 is 2 minus x1, which is 7. So 2 minus 4 minus 2, 2 minus 7 minus 5. So the gradient there is 2 fifths. So we know the gradient, and we've got a choice of points which we can use. I'm going to use b, because it has a 0 in it. That makes it a simpler point to use. So using y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 and you can use y equals mx plus c if you prefer that way uh, we get y minus what I say I'm using I'm using b so y1 is 0 <coughs> equals 2 fifths times x minus x1 which is 2 um, now I want it in this form here so we don't want y equals and we don't want any fractions because it's not written here but it does say a, b and c should be integers, i.e. whole numbers. So I want to get rid of the 5 from here. So I'm going to multiply by 5 before I do anything else. So I shall have 5y is equal to 2 times x minus 2. And then I can expand that. 5y equals 2x minus 4. And I just simply need to gather all the terms on the same side now. So I shall have 5y minus 2x plus 4 equals 0. OK, if you had gathered everything on the other side, you might have had um, positive 2x, negative 5y, and negative 4 equals 0. OK, that's equally correct. Either of those is fine. Part B, a fairly standard question to find the length of a line segment between two points. Um, simple uh, formula based on Pythagoras, um, where we square the difference between the x-coordinates. So x2 minus x1 squared, and add the difference in the y-coordinates, y2 minus y1 squared, square root it all. OK, so in this case, um, I've got, uh, for the x-coordinates, 2 minus 7 squared. For the y-coordinates, 0 minus 4 squared. OK, so we're looking at the square root of 2 minus 7 is minus 5. Square that, 25. 0 minus 4 is minus 4. Square that is 16. So, root 41, and that's about as simple as we can make that. Now, part C um, is a good example of a question where drawing a diagram can really help you to get your bearings. Um, on the face of it, it looks quite complicated, this question. We're given this extra point, C, with an unknown y-coordinate. Um, except that we know that it's greater than 0, so C is above the x-axis. Um, and then this other clue that AC equals AB. Um, I can't really make head nor tail with that without a diagram. Um, but if we draw a diagram, simple one, it doesn't have to be super accurate, suddenly it does become obvious, and it is a one-mark question, um, which means you shouldn't have to do any great calculations. So if we just sketch out some axes here, um, we know that point B has coordinates 2, 0, so that's about here. A has coordinates 7, 4, so it's a bit further along and up here somewhere. 
And all we know about C is that the x-coordinate, so I'll just mark that on the x-axis, that's 2, that's 7, uh, across here on the y-axis, uh, that's 4. Now for, for point C, we just know that the x-coordinate is 2. So actually, point C must be somewhere on this vertical line. Okay, we're also told that t equals 0, uh, so it's greater than 0. So the y value for C must be above the x-axis, so it's not going to be down here. And finally, we're told that AB equals AC. So this length, oh dear, let me just try that again. Okay, you have to pretend that's straight. That length there must be the same as the length from A to C. So C, oh dear, really pretend that these are straight lines. They're equal lengths. Okay, so C must be up here. Okay, so those are congruent triangles because they share this side here and these two are the same length, both right angle triangles. So these lengths here must be the same. Okay, so this bit here is 4. So this bit here must be 4 as well. So that must be 8 and that is the value of t. Helps to have a diagram. And that same diagram um, makes part D rather trivial as well. If I redraw the triangle part, forgive the uh, inaccuracies here, um, but this is A, C, and B, and I know that this length here is the difference between the x-coordinates of A and B, so it's from here across to here. So that's of a length of 5. Um, and I've already established that that's a right angle there. And we've seen that if this is at 0, and this one is at 8, so this length here is 8. So just turn your head 90 degrees to the right, and you'll see that 8 is the base, and 5 is the height. Okay, so the area of ABC is half times base times height, so a half times 8 times 5, which is 20. That's it.